uh, the point of that is to um, limit the number of people who have to be at the event. So we don't have all those extra volunteers. We don't have all these people crammed in pits, uh, things like that, uh, trying to keep everybody safe and, and stuff. So uh, for all of our events, our remote judging will be one week before the in-person robot competition. Um, except for the, the, uh, the one at Bishop Kelly, that one's actually gonna be six days before on the Sunday. Uh, we have to work out some details on, on how to make that work. It might be a little bit more condensed than the other ones, but we'll make it work, okay? So uh, we have Mustang Bishop Kelly, Newcastle and Muskogee uh, all hosting. We appreciate them very much. Uh, I guess next slide. uh there we go remote so the remote tournaments we also have a league tournament um we're calling it the pluto league and you know for all the planets although pluto keeps going back and forth as a planet i'm not sure what its identity is right now but um that's going to be a fully remote league tournament uh right now it's only got four teams in it um but if other teams want to join in that one instead of a in-person um, or if anybody's joining in really, really late and they want to go to one, that's the one to go to. We will figure out a way to make it work. It does not, uh, it doesn't have some of the same features as a in-person tournament, but it's still imminently doable. Um, the judging in these will actually be at the end of, toward the end of the tournament instead of at the beginning, most likely. So um, just a little bit of a difference between the, the, uh, the in-person and everything else. And then we also have something called the last chance qualifying tournament. If you went to your league tournament, which everyone gets to go to one and uh, you didn't make it to state, you didn't qualify for state, this is your chance to kind of show, show us that you, know, you deserved it, right? So, uh, oh darn it, my robot broke in the last match, uh, didn't quite make it to state, whatever. Well, here's your second chance. So um, that one is gonna be a fully remote event um also but uh, that way everyone gets two chances to qualify for state if the other thing is we still have some teams that are uh, not very far along and if they just want to go to that one as their one shot um and just get a competition in that's perfectly fine too uh, nobody says you have to do the leagues if you are uh you know if you you weren't able to or whatever um state championship we are finalizing the details on this but we have one of two sites. It will not be at Swasu this year. It will be in person in the Tulsa slash Tulsa or Muskogee uh, area, uh, either May 1st or 8th. There's 108, uh, one or eight. Um, and that's not finalized yet, but our intent is to have that in person, um, you know, like like we said, and so Swasu is out of school at that point, or I think maybe their graduation is the week before and then they're shut down for the summer. So we can't go to Swasu this year and that's okay. Um, next slide. All right, so what will a league tournament in person bit look like? Okay, so we've been doing these uh, driver's meetings the night before the event starts for our league tournaments. Just to keep things moving along, we're gonna go ahead and do that here as well. Uh, will there be a night before Zoom meeting? We'd like the drivers to call in on on Friday night. Um, during the day, we will, you know, we'll have an arrival time. You know, you, you're gonna arrive and you're gonna get uh, inspected. So you're gonna need to make sure that you're, I don't know how many teams have been following their inspection checklist closely in these remote events, but you will have an inspection when you get there. Uh, we might be a little bit lenient on some things to get people through quickly. Um, I don't have an expectation that uh, everything is going to be perfect, but we'll do the best that we can. Um, we want everyone to be able to play, uh, but we, we're not going to allow anything that's dangerous or, uh, you know, is a, is a advantage or anything like that. So I'm going to encourage everyone to pre-inspect your robots, make sure you're really in, in really good shape. Um, kind of like we do for league meets in a normal year for those of you who have done that with the pre-inspection. Um, we'll have qualifying matches and then alliance selection uh, and then a semifinals and finals. And we will have the awards most likely uh, to speed things along instead of doing everything at the end. Judging will have already happened. We're not gonna be waiting on judges most likely. 
Uh, and so we'll be able to do some awards. They'll probably be between playoff matches just so we can get, get everyone out of there quickly. Um, if we can do things finish faster then we will. Uh, so, you know, I'm not going to hold us to these times specifically. Hopefully we're not running long, but I think with the number of teams roughly between 12 and 16 at each of these tournaments, uh, it, it'll be, you know, it'll, it'll go by pretty fast. It's going to be like a league meet, uh, with Alliance selection. Like for those of you who did league meets before, you just, just show up with your robot, you know? Okay. Anyway, Dean's list interviews. We'll be talking about that in a second. Um, next. So, uh, what to expect? Um, you know, we're, we're not going to provide food. We're trying to like follow all these pro COVID protocols, uh, and limit the number of people there. So we're not going to have spectators in person. There will be a video stream, uh, you know, maximum of 10 people. That would be, you know, students and mentors per team uh, coming in. If you've got another adult who has to be there for uh, supervision or something, that that's fine. Uh, but we need to limit it to 10 people per team. I think that probably covers the size of, of most teams. Judging is going to be remotely. We mentioned that before. Uh, the week before, and then um, we'll have a table for your pit. We do not want teams to bring uh, all the stuff. We want you to bring your robot and anything you need to service your robot, you know, your batteries, your tools, spare parts. Uh, they want your team there with your safety gear, your safety glasses, masks, you know, that stuff. Um, your, your team documentation, like your, uh, uh, you'll be doing a lot of that check-in stuff online beforehand but you know, your, your, your roster, essentially. Um, we don't want you to bring all your stuff for judging that you would normally, your full size pit, uh, you know, there's no spectators. Um, you know, you so say you don't need to bring your engineering notebook and stuff there, just your robot and yourself and whatever you need to make your robot run. That's really, really the extent of it. Think like, you know, it says on here, think league meet. Those of you who did league meets before, you know, we just show up, we throw our robots on the field, we play, and we go home, you know, and it's a party. It's a good time. All right, uh, next. And then we'll have time for a bunch of time for questions and stuff here at the end, too. We have a big, long Q&A time, so as many questions as you want to ask. We'll go ahead and get through this first. Um, so team members need to be registered. Uh, all the teams need to have uh, all your team members registered on firstinspires.org so on the team dashboard the coaches can go in there and check and see which of your teams have been registered uh we prefer to have everybody registered online if there's some teams that for some reason have a limitation uh where they can't register um everybody online let me know i can uh i'm allowed to give out the consent form to teams who really really need it but um you know, for the most part, hopefully, yeah, if, if you've got some parents who can't, who don't have access to the computer, well, you can all do this all on your phone for one thing, but if they don't have access for some reason, um, we can get them a form or you can maybe have them come and register, uh, you know, at a team meeting or something like that online. We need to have all those in place. People who don't have that in place won't be able to come into the building, basically. Um, that's just the first thing this year. They're super, super strict about it. Um, and then, uh, we're going to have a COVID protocol just to, uh, that we'll send out in the couple of weeks before, just to make sure that everyone understands the rules related to that. Uh, Christopher will be going over that in a minute. Um, team has to be registered with first. You wouldn't be able to register for the event and assign to it if you weren't. So I'm not too worried about that, but if there's some teams out there that still need to register, uh, you need to do that. And then you also need to have paid your Oklahoma FTC registration, which, um, th those, went out at the beginning of the year. So double check, we'll, we'll be checking on that in over the next week or two to make sure everyone is paid up. Uh, but hopefully everyone is, is paid their Oklahoma FTC registration fee um, as well. And we mentioned the robot inspection. Um, we won't be extending the inspection time for the in-person event. So if your robot can't pass for some reason, uh, unfortunately, we're just gonna have to move along because we have to, uh, we can't we can't make a bunch of allowances for for teams that aren't inspected. Most teams will have been playing with their robot for months now, um, and uh, and 
So just to make the event move along, we're just going to have to have a drop dead time. If your robot's not inspected, you're not inserted into the, the matches, and that would be really, really unfortunate. Uh, we don't want that to happen to anybody. We, we do our best to work with people to make sure that you get your robot through. And like I said, we may be a, a little lenient this year compared to most years, but uh, we still can't have anything that's dangerous or um, gives the team an unfair advantage and, or, or something like that. All right. Um, the way the tournaments, league tournament works, is that these league meets you've been playing in all along, those scores count. We take the top 10 scores, and those are your starting point for your standings at the league tournament, okay? You'll play five qualification matches at the tournament, just like you would at a qualifier that you're used to, or last year's league tournament, or whatever. Um, and that will add to your ranking. And, th and at the end of that, you'll have 15 matches complete, in theory. Um, and then we will do alliance selection at all of our events. I don't think we have more than uh, 16 teams or so right now. So that's going to give us four alliances of two teams each. So, uh, you know, the way it, the way it normally goes for those of you who maybe you're new to this is the first whoever finished first in the standings gets to pick anybody they want, uh, you know, two through 16 or whatever um, out of that. So if you think the 16 team is a good match for your number one team you pick them. It doesn't matter if they're in the top eight or whatever. The only teams that are guaranteed to play in the playoffs are the top four in the standings. Um, the other ones are by the choice of those top four. And then if like one picks four, for instance, then the fifth alliance, the fifth seed would move up and be the number four picking team. Um, I'm sure most of you are familiar with that, but for those of you who are new, uh, that might be a new thing. And you probably want to go in and read how that works in the game manual. Uh, just so you're you're clear on it, and you can also, uh, you know, the, you you might want to watch a, an online event if you're <laughs> one of the later events. You might want to watch and see how that happens at one of the earlier events. So just so you you know how it is, we are planning to stream all these. Um, the remote tournaments won't have alliance selection or playoffs, but they will have the five matches. So you'll end up with 15 matches, and at the end of that, that's your ranking, and that's how you you finish. So those are a little bit different than the in person events all right and then we're going to i'm going to pass it off to christopher to talk about our covid protocol yeah so one of the things that the um the board has been doing is in evaluating these in-person events and how we can get together is we want to make sure safety is our number one pri priority and safety um we also don't you know in doing that we don't want to have any sort of super spreader event so we've been looking at watching you know, listening to the CDC, watching what's going on in other uh, places around the state and the, the country and seeing how to, to make for a safe event. And so uh, based on that, what we've, the, the structure that Travis has laid out is about getting people in, getting teams in, having a great time, doing what we want to do and what we need to do to have a, a great event, but doing it as quickly and expeditiously as, as possible. And that's part of the reason why we've taken the uh, the drivers meeting out, and moved it in, into a, a virtual event, so that we can reduce the amount of time you got to be on on site. So, you know, we want to. We're not going to have food normally at these events. We might have lunch um, on site. That is not going to be an option. So there's not going to be any any food consumed inside the building. Um, so what we're trying to do is make it late enough in the morning that everybody can show up, have already eaten. And then be able to, so maybe you have a, a late breakfast or early lunch, and then you're ready to, you know, we'll try to have you out of there by five o'clock so that then you can have uh, dinner right after that. Um, if somebody needs to eat, what I'd say, bring snacks, but they'll be outside the building. They're not going to be inside the building. They need to be socially distanced. Um, everybody will be required to wear masks. This isn't, you know, the, there's, there's not, if you can't breathe, wearing a mask and i've heard people say this and i know people who cannot wear masks i'm sorry this this is not an event that you should be at it's not we will not we don't want to be the the mask police we don't want to be um you know enforcing mass policy we expect everybody to self-police we expect mentors and coaches to take the responsibility of making sure their teams are following it. and i recommend that you guys as adults if you set a good example for the most part the kids uh, should have no problems following along. Um, well, we, we expect to have a, 
a touchless thermometer at the door. We'll check people as they come in. And then we'll also have this uh, COVID protocol that we follow, which is going to be a document. And we could have both electronic and paper documents, but basically a document. And it's it's a checklist. It's just everybody goes through and make sure do, do I have a uh, you know a fever or have I recently been asked to quarantine? Have I you know all what are all of the symptoms? Just verifying that you're not having any symptoms of COVID because our ultimate goal here is to create a, a safe environment. And if somebody is showing symptoms, it's just best that they they stay away for for in-person events, it's not worth taking the risk. And, and we believe that everybody will do their best to follow the, the COVID protocol. As part of that protocol, you're also agreeing that you're going to follow the rules, which is you will wear a mask properly and you will um, you know, be respectful and do social distancing and you're not going to you know, uh, violate any of the rules, that sort of thing. Um, I encourage everybody, obviously you gotta have a mask if you're gonna wear a mask, it's gonna be required. Um, you may want to bring multiple masks, which would be totally cool. And we aren't setting any rules around what specific type of masks it has to be. So, you know, we just expect people to, to um, you know, kind of have gone through this and, and know what to expect and, and, and be comfortable. And again, we're not the mask police, but we, what we are doing is we are make, enforcing that as a policy. I encourage you to bring hand sanitizer, Clorox wipes, wipe, keep your surfaces clean, keep, you know, keep, uh, scorch your hand sanitizer periodically. Hardly. I mean, we've been in hand sanitizer. What's that? Do you have a question there, Becky? Um, so as part of the process, we also have put a policy in place for, uh, or some guidelines in place for making a decision as to whether we need to convert one of our planned in-person events to a remote event. Um, so what we've done is we, we've laid that out. Um, and, and what we've done is we've defined that there are some things that will impact whether we can have an in-person event or not. So first and foremost is we're, we're trying to stay in close contact with our event hosts and make sure that everything's okay on their part, that they're not having problems that would result in them canceling the event on their side and so we're we're trying to you know stay closely connected and if something were to happen with the event host and they said i'm sorry we can't host this event that's an immediate trigger for us to to flip to convert that event into a remote event um the second thing is that if we have a bunch of teams so we you can expect as a team that's going to be showing up for an event to receive a survey and that survey is just a confirmation. Are you going to be able to show up? Has something happened in your, you know, with your school's policies or with your organization's policies that says that you guys cannot participate in person in this event? And if we have too many teams have to back out and not uh, be able to participate in an event, then we are going to have to convert it to a remote event. And right now we've set that threshold at eight teams. Um, so normally we wouldn't have a, a qualifier with with less than 12 teams. We've made we're making some concessions here. If it if it falls down to eight teams, we should be okay. If it goes below eight teams, then we really can't do um, the final rounds, and it's not really a very effective event. So we would have to um, convert to a, a remote event at that point in time. If we don't have enough volunteers, so um, right now, we believe that we've got the volunteers covered, covered. but um, I'm going to mute you, Adam. Oh, there you go. You got it. Um, but if you, if for whatever reason, our volunteers have to back out, um, then that's going to create a, a situation where we can't safely host the event. So what we'll do in that case is, and, and just so you know, like all of the, the um, events are, are the, the judging is all remote, so we're not expecting those volunteers to be on site. It's just really the volunteers that are that are running the uh, in-person matches, the, the inspectors, the FTA, the announcers, the, the referees, and so forth, um, and you know the people people movers. Um, and then the last thing is there is a final say that the board may have if something happens and the board believes that there's a reason why we need to just go ahead and 
convert an uh, in-person event to a remote event, then the board gets the final say as to whether whether that goes. We don't anticipate, you know, those top three are the reasons why we would, you know, primarily expect something to uh, force uh, an in-person event to a remote event. Um, but ultimately, if there's, you know, the board does have final say on that. So those are the things to be aware of. Um, our goal is to know with a great deal of certainty two weeks in advance. Um, and I would, I think that, you know, with the current COVID situation, how things are progressing, I personally believe that we're in, in good shape. I, I, I'm cautiously optimistic that everything's going to go off the way we want it to, but you, who knows what could happen in, in the next four weeks. So. All right. And then I think I turn it back over to uh, you, Travis. Actually, it looks like we're turning over to Chris, but one second, uh, Sue Ellen had a good question in the chat. And that was if it, her team cannot attend in person, uh, can they switch to the remote or last chance tournament? And the answer to that is yes. If you in cannot. Fact, well, well if, uh, yeah, so I'm sorry, go ahead, Travis. Yeah, I was gonna say, uh, if if too many teams can't attend in person then we'll just convert the entire tournament to uh to a remote and you would still be in that tournament unless for some reason you couldn't even attend the remote tournament that week uh, the plan is to have the remote league tournament as a um opportunity for any team that couldn't attend in person at all and then the last chance tournament is for um any team that whether or not they competed they didn't qualify for state so the last chance is remote. I see uh, Dina has a uh, question on there. So that is, um, so, so yeah, that will be. It, it, so the last remote. chance is intended for every team. You know, if you're a team that did not earn a, an invitation to state in your league tournament, you automatically get the opportunity to participate in the last chance remote um, and we'll call it a qualifier. It's not really a tournament. It's a qualifier. So yeah, that would be your last chance to be able to qualify for a state uh, event. Right. Okay. Okay. So, um, but we've got plenty of time for questions at the end too. Uh, we'll go ahead and, and uh, let Chris talk about the video stream. Thank you. Good evening. And mine won't take that long. I got, I think the easiest slide here. Uh, we're going to set it up if internet is available and the technology at the host site we will live video stream through our Twitch channel. Uh, the Twitch is the first in Oklahoma and we have combined it. So you, you, know, you will see FLL, you know, FTC and FRC events move along through this. Um, as we gathered this year as a new board, you know, we're, we're figuring things out. So we just ask bear with us because you know how technology is and with the robots, if something's gonna happen or break, it usually does. So these first few meets that we have, We'll probably working out the kinks on it, uh, but we'll try to make it as smooth as possible and broadcast from the time you know we get set up a little bit before the matches start and just keep it running continuously to the end and uh, see how that works out. And then if anybody has any suggestions for me afterwards or something, I'm more than happy to take those and see what we can do to make it better. Awesome. And, and just so everybody's aware, one of the things that we do rely on on these uh, these live streams is having a good internet connection at the school itself. It's a factor that we can't really control sometimes. So just be aware of that. Yeah, and the other thing I would mention is if, uh, you know, we don't want Chris to necessarily have to do this all by himself all season. Um, and so if we have people who are, you know, I know we've got gamers out there who probably run their own Twitch channel and uh, stream themselves as they play, uh, oh, you know, Call of Duty or Apex Legends or whatever, right? Um, I, I'm sure that we have some Twitch streamers out there that are pros at this. And, you know, hey, it'd be really cool to stream a robotics competition. Um, you know, let us know because uh, we can probably use some help on the video crew. Uh, Chris is fantastic and has done a great job with uh, setting up all of our streaming so far. Really appreciate him and, and the other folks who have helped out with that. But, uh, you know, it, going in the future, if, if we have more events, say we go back to uh, next year and we're able to have a lot of in-person events, 
it'd be fantastic if we could stream all of them. So um, that's just something to think about. Maybe bring back to your your teams or your your alumni or people who uh, people who are affiliated with your team who might have an interest in doing something like this. And also, you know, everybody there that has a phone, if you feel you want to stream or anything, you feel free to do it. There's no restrictions there as as well. So don't think just because if we have one here, you can't do it. We we actually encourage you know, if you want to stream or show for your you know, the parents and family and friends, please do. Thank you, Chris. All right. Um, so we have a, a uh, new statewide judge advisor helping us out this year. And I think most of you probably know him. He's been uh, around helping at tournaments a lot and, and things the last couple of years have been uh, sitting in on a lot of the meetings um, on, on our uh, Zoom calls with Ingrid and stuff. Um, so Chris Silvano is going to talk a little bit about how the judging is going to go. Thanks for that, Travis. Uh, hi, my name is Chris Silvano. Uh, I've been uh, judging and, and involved in a lot of the different aspects of FTC over the past few years. So um, there are some things for some of the more veteran teams that is going to be different this year, but there are some things that are going to remain the same. And I want to go through it. And I actually have two slides. And before I say any of it, specific guidance is going to flow down later on. Obviously, we're trying to keep this town hall short, and there'll be a Q&A session at the end. And this is probably going to generate more questions as we uh, give out the details. So this is just a notional opening to expose everybody to the judging protocols for this year. Um, as Chris Smith and Travis and everyone else said, uh, to hammer it home again, um, Judging will be conducted remotely. It does not matter whether the, the league tournament is in person, remote, or the last chance qualifier. It's still gonna be done uh, remotely with the interviews done in advance and you will get the schedule done in advance. Of course, those dates, um, once we confirm all the dates and the venues, um, you know that interview will likely happen the weekend before that qualifier is set to happen. Um, and on the, the next slide, I'll talk a little more about the actual judging interview itself. This is just more the logistics. Um, documents will be uploaded in advance. Of course, usually there's the shuffling of papers at an in-person event where you're handing off all these notebooks to the judges and the control awards and everything like that. That's not happening. Like Travis said, you're gonna show up to your qualifier and you're already gonna be done with all the judging and all the paperwork. So you won't have to worry about that. Um, the award categories that we're going to be going for are described in Game Manual Part 1 under Section 9.5. I throw out a lot of Game Manual Part 1 in here. Go back and reread that. Um, that will give you more details, and you can ask more questions after you do that. So when it comes to the actual documents that you're going to be submitting for these qualifiers, there's only one document in per se that's required, and that's gonna be an engineering portfolio. Um, and going back to what Travis has said previously, um, we want every team in theory to have the ability to build a robot and go through this year and document the engineering design process. But you know, if things do happen that you do not have a robot, you can still submit an engineering portfolio without having an actual robot built. Um, that is something that I think is lost on a lot of people. And for the veteran teams out there, this is important. There is an engineering portfolio and there's an engineering notebook. The portfolio is required and has a lot of other requirements that are new this year. The notebook is what many teams are used to doing and that is supposed to be supplemental information. So the FTC scoring software will allow for only three uploads to happen on that site right now. The engineering portfolio, which we will judge material off of. Then you have the judging feedback request form, which is optional. This is something that is uh, new this year. You have to fill out a form with some preamble at the top and then the judges will look at it. If you don't submit that form, uh, you do not get that feedback. Um, I checked, Tom, for your answer, game manual part one. 
um, I've checked both the remote and traditional events and they are the same numbers. Um, I don't know if Travis wants to come in real quick and tell us what, since this is a hybrid model, um, whether we'll be staying with traditional or remote part one. Um, that's a good question. I will check. So if it, for the remote part, uh, if it's a judge, judge related thing, it's going to be for the remote. And if it's a robot game thing, it's going to be for the uh, traditional events. So um, if we're talking about judging right now, follow what it says for the judging, because we're not doing in person, for instance, control award stuff. Um, and the control award, uh, I don't know if you mentioned this already or, or about to mention this, but there you can provide a, a link inside your control award submission for a video. Clearly, if we were in person, we wouldn't have to do that. The judges could look at your robot on the field and see what it does, right? But they're not going to be able to do that because the judging is actually occurring before the in-person part of the event. Okay. So yeah, that we, we will follow um, Travis's guidance on that. But remember, the section numbers are the same. Um, so you have the, the judging feedback form, which is optional. And then like Travis has hinted at the control ward. The control ward is normally a question that I would ask in an in-person interview. And I would go, hi, is your team going for the control ward? And you have to opt into that award. Um, that is one where you're demonstrating your strategy and your autonomous programming and your sensors and um, other things that would would make your robot pretty robust because of course if we're going to in-person events you're going to go from one robot on the field to now two for your alliance and two for the other alliance so there's a lot more uh, strategy involved the control ward submission form is in game manual part one appendix e you have to submit that and upload that ahead of time in order to be considered eligible for that award um, similar to the judging feedback, no form, you can't be considered for any of that feedback and information from the judges. So of course the FTC scoring software only supports those three file uploads right now. And like Travis is hinting at, there's plenty of other things I think you can think of to supply useful information. The engineering notebook, which uh, is a longer version of the portfolio, of course, YouTube videos or files demonstrating your autonomous capabilities. Um, if you have any flyers or anything you are doing, for instance, for um, outreach, um, we're going to try and set up an external form to submit that information because, of course, the scoring software is limited in that capability. Before we go on to the next slide, I will say one quick thing about portfolio versus notebook without reading the entire paragraph out. The engineering portfolio, which is what we will judge the criteria for the awards off of, is a short and concise summary of the engineering notebook. And the game manual part one kind of spells out what you're trying to delineate. I would not be surprised to see some of the information in your portfolio duplicated in your notebook, but you only have 15 pages in the... Um, portfolio. So that is an important thing to note. Um, Travis, yeah, so just to reiterate, um, some teams were hesitant to compete for the control award. It would be feared that they would knock, knock themselves out for other awards. Can a team win control award and inspire? Yes. That is an important thing. Well, I, I will I, let, caveat me, let that. me clarify. Let me clarify that. Go so, ahead. uh, the way that the control award was handled in Oklahoma and some other places in the past wasn't uh, quite the way that first wanted it done. Um, so if you compete for the control award, like you're the only team who competes for the control award, whether or not you have a good uh, uh, thing and you know, you, you, know, you win the control award, um, you know, in, in theory, you're not allowed to win two awards. Uh, at the competition. You can maybe win second place in an award or something, but um, but you're not allowed to win two. In fact, the way they do awards now, you may, you may only uh, be awarded one award, first, second, or third, or whatever. And, and there's, there's some ambiguity there and there's some things that we'll have to, to work out. But uh, 
in the past, we've often given out the control award and the and, and given that team who wanted a, another award if they were one of the few teams that did it. The guidance this year that we have is that if there's no team that is worthy of a particular award, we don't have to give the award. So like, for instance, if you won the Inspire Award and you were the, also the only team who was eligible for the control award, then you'd probably just get the one award and the Inspire Award would just not be awarded at that particular event. So there's, they fixed some things. Um, is the control award given at every qualifier? Uh, yes, it is. That's the, that was the question from Suzanne. Um, that is, uh, that, that one is given at every qualifier. There are a couple of awards. I don't think we we're covering here that are only given at state. Uh, do you want to talk about those, Chris, or do you want me to mention them well, really, well, really I, fast? Well, it's the promote and the compass awards, correct? Yeah. And yes. they, they, they're through video submissions. Um, right. I don't have the question that they usually try and answer ahead of time, but yeah. that is a good point is that the, the, the five or six predefined awards that are in section 9.5, those are the ones that will be um, attempted to give out during every single um, qualifier. The promote and compass award are in a separate section, and those are the only ones that go in at state, and that's an opt-in award as well. Um, Travis, do you have anything else you want to add to that? No, we, we'll send out more information about how to submit those later. Those aren't a requirement for these uh, league tournaments and, and other things here, so. Okay, um, and I think that is all I had on this slide. Um, we can go to the next slide. So now to actually get to the judging. So this is my second and last slide. Um, I'm gonna try and take this from two different angles. I'm aware that there are rookie teams, specifically ones that may have came from FLL to FTC. And there, there's also veteran teams that I'm gonna sound like a broken record compared to the previous years, but there are some adaptations given the fact that we're doing remote judging. Um, judging sessions are dictated per game manual part one, 9.4.1. Um, everybody will get two interviews or two sessions with the judges. If you're an FLL, you only remember that you get the one. So just remember that everybody will get two sessions. This time, however, because of the nature of the remote um, judging, that second interview, so to speak, is going to be pre-scheduled. So both of these will be on a schedule that you will know ahead of time. And the expectation is both of these would happen on the same day. Um, so let's go through those two. The first one is your initial interview. Um, and what happens is this is a 15 minute interview and first states that teams get up to five minutes of uninterrupted time for a presentation. Um, some teams don't go the full five minutes. Some teams don't prepare it. It is just a, a, um, accommodation that you get five minutes of uninterrupted time. The judges are supposed to sit back and not ask any questions unless you say you are done. Following that five minutes of uninterrupted uh, presentation is a 10 minute Q&A session. And this is where it's gonna be different this year. Um, you're gonna have that 15 minutes regardless, but you're gonna have one of two options on how you wanna spend that five minutes. That five minutes can be either a pre-recorded, unedited, one cut video where you go through your robot, your outreach, anything you want to talk about, pre-record it, upload it to the external form, and the judges will look at it beforehand. And then you would do the 10 minutes of Q&A. Or you can do the five uninterrupted minutes on the uh, video conferencing that we do. Um, and again, you would still get the 10 minutes. I'm going to get up on a, a short soapbox real quick and say why I recommend you do the five minutes of an uninterrupted video unedited. Number one, you get multiple takes at it. Uh, number two, um, as some of you may have been involved in with the FLL judging and everything else going on right now, um, things happen. Teammates get sick. Power goes out, as you're finding out this week. And um, uh, I, I will say real quick, because uh, it was quite a coincidence is that I was talking to Travis last night and just before um, I went to go talk to Travis on a video call, his internet went out. So, it, you know, things find a mysterious way to go out 
in terms of your internet and everything else and video quality. So um, having that five minutes of a pre-recorded video is probably a good way to go. You can do this. I have seen teams do this in a room together. I have seen it do it over a Zoom call or something, but it also gives you a good way to kind of show off your robot. And that's the important thing is, you know, with a pre-recorded video, you'd probably be also to bring in your camera and say, here, we have this intake mechanism. We have this firing mechanism. So, and then you can also create somewhat of a script and allow everybody to, um, to, to have their say. The final thing I will say, regardless of how you go, whether you go the five minutes of unedited video or the five minutes in person with the judges, I would recommend if you do not already try to have a redundant, a redundant person or a backup person who knows a little bit about another part of the robot. If you have been programming all year, you may want to know a little bit about how some of it was designed or design decisions and vice versa. If you built the robot, you should be doing the programming. There's been many times, even in person events, where I heard that our superstar programmer had something happen today and he's not available. And you guys may have done some spectacular programming, but if no one can talk about it, that is unfortunate. And maybe we can find that through the, your documentation, but you all may have an angle on it that we didn't see in the notebook in the portfolio. So um, a backup is important for that. Outside of that 15 minute interview, of course, the judges will meet and we will have discussions. Um, we're gonna have what's called an afternoon visit. This is normally called a pit interview, but um, obviously since we're not gonna be at the event in person, we're not gonna be interviewing you at your pit. So we're gonna, again, pre-schedule 15 minutes maximum and it's gonna be kind of fluid. It won't be more as structured as the initial interview, but we'll get 15 minutes to, you know, have another pair of judges, maybe some that you've seen before, some that are different, um, ask questions. And they can ask questions about your different, um, your outreach, your robot, strategy, design decisions, challenges that you've overcome. There's plenty of things they could ask. It is an open Q&A session. Um, you may bring your robot to the interview, but it is not required. The only thing that I recommend that you do bring to the interview is that um, you have a copy of your engineering notebook available because we'll be looking through the engineering portfolio and then we can refer to the engineering notebook for additional information. But, you know, if there's something that we, um, you know, there's a lot of material to review in a short amount of time. If we say, okay, can you describe some of the outreach or some of the reasons how you got new mentors involved in FIRST? If you have people who can pull that up real quickly and go, it's engineering notebook section N4 or B2 or whatever, that will help you out. And it's not a closed book exam. You can, you can use that information at the uh, afternoon visit. And since we're not taking any materials away from you, you don't really have to memorize that. You should have your notebook well-structured, but use all that information to your advantage. So like Travis said, more information will come out soon. And of course, there'll be a Q&A session at the end. But um, if any of you all have questions, feel free to reach out. And uh, we'll, there, there's still plenty of things we have to figure out. But uh, it, it is definitely something that this is a big difference between your league meets and your, your qualifiers is the judging. And of course, judging can also dictate advancement as well. So um, read up on game manual part one. I know um, all, the, all the people, all the, the human players have been focused on game manual two, but it may be worth it to get some people to read back into game manual one. A lot of good information there. I'll turn it back to Travis. Okay, uh, real quick uh, follow-up question for Matt Moore. Um, initial interview takes place before contest day, but the afternoon visit, the afternoon visit will also take place before the in-person event. So uh, our plan right now is to have these on Saturdays or possibly a Sunday in one case uh, prior to our in-person event. So it's one week before. Um, 
and you'll have a scheduled time for morning interview and a scheduled time for the follow-up. And so like if the team wants to be together for the first one and then, and then can be on zoom for the second one or something like that, or if they're on zoom for all of them, uh, and I'm generically calling, it'll probably be zoom, but, um, it might be, uh, something else. Um, you know, then however the team can get together to talk to the judges is fine. They don't have to be all in the same room together or anything like that. Uh, as far as answering questions from the notebook goes, um, I'd even go a step further than what uh, Chris said and say that, you know, if they ask, if the judges ask you a question about your notebook, you know, one of your team members can have that pulled up where they can share their screen and say, here's the information, you know, and uh, just show it right to the judges right then and there. I know that uh, a lot of um, uh, teams do do that. Okay, and then- I, uh, I, I can answer that question if you want, the Vince question. Yeah, sure. So um, quick thing about the control ward. Um, the PDF that is available for the control ward has a place to put a YouTube link and it should be something where we're gonna try to have it to where you can upload a video. Strict requirements say that section 3.9.3.4 in game manual part one under engineering portfolio requirements engineering portfolio may not include links to videos or other files. So that has to be done on the control award form. And then um, we're gonna try and have that form set up to where you could, you could also upload that file. Um, honestly, Tom, for YouTube or Google link, either or, and I would think Travis is that as long as it is accessible to the judges, um, you, the team is going to have to host it through their own capabilities. Yeah, it's just going to be basically whatever you're doing for uh, uploading videos of your match that you've been doing already. So it could be, you know, it just has to be uploaded somewhere where the judges can watch it easily and just provide the link. It's just like what Ingrid's been doing with the matches. Right, because that portfolio is just a PDF. It, it is, the requirements are spelled out of how many pages, and it just says may not include links to other videos or files. Um, and Ingrid brings up an excellent point that comes up almost every year. Please, 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 if you do a Dropbox, Google Drive, iCloud, or something, make sure that it is in a shared or public folder because by default, many files are oftentimes locked to the user or a group that is managing that drive. And what you don't want happen is to have the judges click on a link and then it says you need to request permissions. And uh, I, Ingrid, I feel your pain. And I agree with you on that. Yeah, and we'll do what we can to uh, check those beforehand before the judges see them. But um, you're, you're the if you pay close attention to it and make sure that didn't happen, that's even better. Cause then we're not having to track down somebody at the last minute and say, uh, uh, Hey, can you fix the permission on this? And you know, you're, you're on the, you're not even anywhere near a computer or whatever. Right. So I, I spilled my drink right in front of me. That was not, that was, that was good. <laughs> All right. I guess uh, it's my segment. Yes. Ingrid. We're going to pass it on to our head referee. So uh, we have been having coaches and drivers meetings pretty much every single time before each meet to discuss rules or discuss a few different issues that we've had uh, from seeing certain matches and stuff. Um, we are going to continue that with uh, these uh, in-person tournaments. And even if it gets turned into a remote uh, we're going to continue with doing a driver's meeting. It will be the Friday evening before your in-person tournament. And if it happens to be remote, we will give you a certain uh, date uh, depending on when the remote session turns on and stuff. But we are going to definitely have a uh, coaches and driver's meeting. It is mandatory for you to come just like if you are in an in-person event. Uh, we have everybody come. We have at least one representative from each team come to uh, talk about rules, ask questions, listen to everybody else's questions, just so that way we get all on the same page. Now, here's the thing. Whenever you go to an in-person tournament, the rules are gonna be a little bit different. Okay, most of the rules that we have been doing using so far, they are the same. 
but we have to use the traditional game manual too when we do an in-person tournament. And that game manual has additional rules. If you look at the two manuals, the traditional and the remote side by side, they use the same exact rule numbers for the rules. But on the remote one, there are a few rules that are, they're gone. So you'll be going along and you'll see GS6, uh, GS7, and then GS8 has disappeared out of game manual two for the remote. Well, it's, it's in the traditional one. And so um, there are one, two, three, four, five, six rules that are in the traditional that are not in the remote. And these rules pretty much pertain to anything that can be on the defense side of stuff, what you can and can't do defensively. Um, so this talks about forcing an opponent to break a rule, egregious behavior, uh, autonomous interference, um, you have ring interference, tower goal interference, descoring, blocking, all those sorts of things. So make sure you read up on those because they are greatly going to affect how your strategy is, how your robot operates on the field, how it uh, coordinates with your alliance partner, because so far you've been just playing by yourself. Now you have three other robots on the field. So let's take, for instance, autonomous. We've all been programming our autonomous to do all the things that you can possibly do during autonomous. And so now what if you have an alliance partner who also wants to run their autonomous program that does all the things? That's really intense and you might have some robot crashes. So it would probably behoove you to make some different autonomous programs that can work well with other teams. And definitely talk to your alliance partner before the match starts and say, hey, this is what my auto is going to do. What does your auto do? How can we make this work without actually destroying each other or going accidentally to the other side of the field and messing up their autonomous program, which by the way, that's a big penalty. Don't do that. So you gotta keep those in mind. Also think about gameplay during driver control period or any type of period. You have rings flying in the air that are not just from your robot. So you may have to redesign your robot to be able to handle those rings from getting stuck on top of your robot. Uh, so think about those kinds of things. Also, whenever you shoot a ring, all this season, we have had full access to the low, middle, and high goal. And that's all you have to score with. When you go to a live event, the middle goal is swapped. You have two towers on the field. And at a live event, the tower that is for your alliance, the middle, the mid goal is actually for the opposing alliance. So what happens is you shoot, oh no, you score in the mid goal and it's the wrong mid goal. You don't get penalized, but you just give your opposing alliance some points. So take these things into consideration, game strategy, robot building and design, uh, programming. You're probably gonna have to change some things up. So take all these things, and start planning now. It's gonna take you about a month to get through all that. You have about a month, a month and a half, depending on which, uh, which tournament that you're going to, to make this happen. So I would strongly advise every team to read through Game Manual 2 for traditional. Also get on the forums. The forums are split into traditional and remote. Start reading some of those traditional things. And it might even be best if you uh, can check out some traditional YouTube videos of other teams that have been playing in traditional events. Um, so that way you can kind of see how gameplay works in that kind, of a, um, that kind of a scenario. So that way you are much better equipped to do this. Now I see I have a whole bunch of little questions down in the chat. Um, let's see. Hey, Ingrid, I uploaded two videos into the chat from um, YouTube that are of a traditional event. Awesome. Thank you so much, Janet. Um, there are, there are uh, quite a few regions around the world that have been doing live events so far, and there are some really impressive matches to watch. Um, and I think 
Russia is still in the lead with the highest score. And so you might want to take a look at some Russian events, but um, there's, there's a lot to watch out there on YouTube. Uh, let's see, respond to text and chat. Da, 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 da. Another important consideration. Um, yep, and see tower rules. We have, two. Uh, Tom Hensley says, we have two weeks. Well, you better start reading right now. <laughs> Um, and uh, Chris uh, put the uh, forum link in the in the chat as well. So um, yeah, I think that's that's a, that's about it for my segment. So I will give it back to Travis. Okay, thank you, Ingrid. And uh, one last thing here. I think this is our last thing before we get to the Q and A bit. I wanted to mention the Dean's List Award. Um, Dean's List Finalist Award is actually technically what it is at the state level. Um, the Dean's List Award's a, I guess, international uh, award. Only 10 people are selected from FTC out of the entire world to win it. Uh, 10 out of FRC. We've had, we had a three-year streak going there where we had a winner each year of three years from Oklahoma, which was really, really cool. Uh, I don't think there's been many um, many regions that have had three winners ever, much less three years in a row. So uh, these are, you know, really top students and first. Each team may nominate two students. Uh, the coach has to submit um, the nomination. They need to be a sophomore or a junior. There's actually a Dean's List uh, document on the uh, first website there that you can look about what you kind of need to focus on when you're writing your recommendations. Um, and the teams that I used to coach, we would frequently have the seniors contribute a lot of writing to the uh, to write about the sophomores and juniors that were being nominated. It has to be somebody who your team buys into as well. You can't just like uh, pick a person who everybody else on the team doesn't like for some reason, right? They they don't they think they don't do a good job. You don't want to do that, right? It has to be kind of a team buy-in thing. Um, so the submissions are made on the first dashboard. We're going to have a dean's list event listed on the first website. Uh, it'll be listed as April 1st. So sometime that week, we'll be conducting the interviews. Um, they won't necessarily be all on April 1st, but they'll be sometime within a week or so of April 1st. So that what that means is that by, uh, I didn't put this on here, but March 15th is the deadline for submitting for an event. Now, some of you may have already actually submitted, I heard one team at least that submitted something already and they submitted it and said they would be attending one of the uh, uh, league tournaments. And that's okay. If it, if it goes in the system, we should be able to find it as long as it's submitted to an Oklahoma event. But I would recommend the April 1st event, which isn't in tonight, but they told me it'll be live in the system tomorrow. So if tomorrow you go in and see Oklahoma first Dean's list, um, then that's where you'll be able to submit stuff for your team. Uh, so We'll probably do sign up genius or something like that to set the actual times. Um, didn't have any questions on that one so far, but anyway, that's, I think that's all we, I think we have a big, it's the question box time, uh, except instead of Ingrid or the referees being the question box, the, que the floor is pretty much open to anybody who you want to ask. So, or for group discussion as well. So we're definitely running four robots in a match at the in-person. Yes. Okay. Yep. And if it ends up being eight teams at a tournament, um, I mean, there is a rule in there where we have to give like five minutes space in between matches. And right. so what we will do is um, if it seems like we're just waiting around because no one really needs that five minutes, we're going to just go ahead and go on with the match. And so unless a team is like, oh, our, oh my gosh, our, our wheel just popped off. Okay, you get the five minutes, put that wheel back on. And so we'll, we'll make it official that way. But if, if we don't need to wait the five minutes, we're just going to move on to the next match. And, and to be clear, the five minute rule is that if a team is playing in a match and then they immediate play, immediately play in the next match, yes. they're supposed to be given five minutes to do whatever they need to, to change batteries, to recover, to take, you know, go get a restroom break or whatever it is. 
five minutes to do that before you start the next match. And what missing Ingrid's saying is that if we don't need that, we're not going to force it. If, if everybody's okay with moving on, we're just going to keep going. Otherwise it can actually extend the, the uh, time for the entire event. We can have longer events, even though we have fewer teams than if you had 16 teams there. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, w w for the schedule last year, we ran into this when, when we were running league meets in person, because we'd have like, we had, uh, we had 11 teams show up to one of the events instead of 12. And uh, by throwing in that, just having that one extra team or one less team, because of that rule, it actually did add all these five minute breaks in because you would have teams that would have to play back to back. And if you've got at least 12 teams, you don't have to play back to back. But if you've got less than 12 teams, then you will run into that. Um, and so I expect that to happen uh, at any event that we drop below 12. But at the same time, like like uh, they were saying, we'll, we will push through and make it quick uh, as fast as we can. But we're not going to penalize any teams. We're going to give them the fair amount of time if they need it. So cause there's something else I want to also highlight on. I know that Sue asked a question, but on that too, because there's a term that also comes up a bit that could be important, especially if we have an odd number of teams due to some issues. There's also the idea of a proxy match. So the scorekeeping system will obviously, you know, uh, it will randomly start generating matches. And I don't know if anybody has, they want to clarify proxy matches, but essentially you are, you may be playing in more matches than what you would normally be prescribed to play in. You would essentially be filling in so that some, some other team could get their fifth match in. You, you may be in your sixth match personally, but it may be the fifth match for everybody else. Uh, my understanding is for that proxy match, your score does not count, but I would take that as honestly, even if it doesn't count, that's just another match. You get to do strategy, scoring, practicing, working with teammates that can work into your scouting for alliance selections. So, and then of course, gracious professionalism says, you know, you're being given another shot to show your, strut your stuff so obviously putting your best foot forward even in a proxy match is something that happens um in-person events that go to that will have a little note that says who is doing what proxy match and yeah, that's usually that's, denoted by a star right next to your uh, right. your your team number in the match list and and so yes like chris was saying you know gracious professionalism just because that match doesn't count towards your, your ranking points doesn't mean you should bomb it. You need to, you need to play to the, your best ability for that team because that's part of gracious fresh professionalism. We are there as for cooperation to help boost each other as well as compete against each other. When will okay. the engineering portfolios be due? Uh, they will be due probably two two days or so before the judging occurs so like say that thursday we just that'll give us enough time to uh double check and make sure that ever that all the notebooks or all the materials can be accessed by those who need to review them so we we will send out some additional guidance here in the next week or so uh, we'll be sending stuff out by uh league tournament so um before your league tournament probably three weeks uh, before the, when the matches are. So maybe two weeks before two, you know, one and a half or two weeks before the, uh, the judging happens, we'll send out some guidance that says, here's when things need to happen. And there'll be a little bit of, there'll be some more specific things there. Yeah. We're already two weeks out from our interview. That's why I'm like, well, well when do we got to get this stuff in? It's, it's coming yeah. up quick. We'll, we'll try to get that out for you real quick, Tom. We okay, got a bunch you. of questions here. I'm going to try to answer real fast. So, uh, Sue Ellen says, is asking about the Dean's List nomination. Um, okay, so the Dean's List event is the interview. Uh, no, April 1st, that week sometime, when you sign up, when you submit for the nomination, you know, you're going to submit that by March 15th because you have to, so the deadline traditionally in FTC is, uh, the 15th of the month before the month the event occurs in where they're interviewed at. 
So instead of spreading these out among all the different tournaments like we normally do, uh, where we interview in person, we're just going to have one event. It's going to be on April 1st where we do the interviews. It, now, like I said, it may vary slightly from April 1st. Like if we have somebody who's, they have to get interviewed, but they, you know, they need to, that there's just no way they can do it on April 1st. Well, we're going to try to make it, you know, maybe the two weekends, April 1st and April 8th. So they get the choice there, but we'll try to do as many as we can on April 1st uh, with a little leeway, a little bit of flexibility. And uh, then they will be announced. The winners will be announced at the state competition like they usually are. Um, I think related to that, uh, how many, I believe we have three. I will need uh no, 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 Travis, Travis, she's yeah. asking um, how many um, people. Oh, drive can't... team. Okay, for how many limit for team? Uh, whatever it said on the first document, I think it was 10 people per team. Right, and um, that includes the two adult mentors. Yes. Mentors, coaches, and so when it comes to your drive team, you have a coach, which could be a student, could be an adult, two drivers, which have to be students, and a human player. If you don't have enough people and the other team that you're working with also doesn't have enough people, then you can use an adult for a human player. But you do have to have a human player. It could be from either team in your alliance. So you need to have four people prepared to be on a drive team. Right, so it's, it's up to eight people per team, including the two adults. And you have two adults there. Dan, are so, you saying you, you only have uh, three kids that can attend? Or are you saying that you have a lot more kids, but only three of your youngest kids can attend? No, we have seven kids, but I'm what I'm I guess what I'm asking is, you know, how many of those seven kids can attend the in-person event? All of them can. If you've got seven kids, all of your your kids can attend with uh, up to three adults. It's a total of 10 people. Oh, okay, great. Thank you. Yes, Dean's List nominations are due March 15th. Can we, I think there was another question that was asked as well about um, teams who are unable to um, compete in all their matches going into the league tournament. Um, I'm trying to see that question because I know that was that was asked. Yeah, that was. I think I saw that earlier from uh, before we got in this one about from Adam. Yeah, uh, if you didn't make it to any of the virtual events, we'll be behind in in the in person events. Um, so I was actually looking here to see how things are calculated. League tournament ranking calculations um, is section five point two in game manual part one for traditional events anyway. Uh, league tournament rankings are based on the top 10 matches from all previous league meets, plus the top five matches from the league tournament. The 10 league meet matches are selected using the sort order from section 5.1, which is like basically your top scores. Teams with fewer than 15 total matches after the qualification matches at the league tournaments uh, have been played will only be ranked on the matches they have played. So... Uh, they're and then, taking you're this generating year, ranking points yes this year go ahead it, well this year it's a big deal because your ranking points are based on your score whereas in previous years they were based on your uh you know win loss or tie so two points one point or zero points and when you're dealing with just the win loss or tie and you're only factoring in the you know if you want all of your matches but you only played in 10 matches, then you would have an average of two and that would give you a really high ranking. This year, that's not the case. Um, this year, because you, you know, whatever your points are that you score. So if you score 400 points per match and that blows everybody away, you could jump way up into the ranking points if you only play in five matches. You may not be at the very top because the other teams that are there have played, you know, 10 other matches and that may move them up even higher. But those ranking points at the the in person event will, you know, they're they're they, they make a huge difference just because it's the total score. Does that make sense? Yes.
I'm still trying to understand the ranking points uh, altogether, but <laughs> they're a little bit wacky. And yes, it could, um, it will be different this year because I believe you're giving your Alliance score for um, the in-person event. And we're sort of mixing apples and oranges here a little bit yep. the way we're doing this, but the, the rank should still be similar. Yeah. Hey, yeah. hey, Chris, do you have a link for a document that explains the scoring system that you could drop in the chat? It's game it's, manual part one. Game manual part yeah. one. That's right. There you go. I'm looking it, at it right now. <laughs> it, it is confusing. And, and part of what makes it confusing is the fact that we are doing remote league meets and we're doing in-person uh, events. Um, keep in mind that your, your remote scores, everybody is, is on e equal playing uh, field or level playing field going into these in-person events because everybody has done remote. Now, what may make it unequal is that if you've only participated in one league meet, and you've got six scores that may put you at a disadvantage versus another team or the other teams that have had 10 scores that they get submitted. But you may still be higher ranked higher than all or some of those teams just because you've done really well in those six matches it's based on your score so if you scored 100 points in in a match that then contributes 100 points to your your ranking points if you score 300 points then it contrib contributes 300 points so you add up all six of those matches that you participated in and then that will factor into your ranking points at the actual league meet itself I'm sorry, the league tournament itself with five more matches and those matches then will be played with an alliance partner. And instead of scoring, you know, hundred points as a, as an alliance, you might be scoring two or 300 points. That number that as alliance you ended up with is what you get in your, your ranking at the event itself. Yeah. So you're, and, and, you're getting bonus points. School, you're getting bonus points playing in person, basically. Yeah, and I would I would be surprised if the like the elite teams that are scoring, you know, 250 points actually don't have reduced scores going into in-person events because their strategies have to completely change. So, you know, for instance, if you have right. a team that's scoring um, both wobble goals and, uh, you know, maybe they can score all four rings that are on the floor plus three rings that are in the robot and they can do that, you know, consistently remotely and that's a significant contributor to their their uh, ranking points for remote events when they show up in person they may lose some of that because their alliance partner now has control of one of the wobble goals so now maybe they can't place that second wobble goal or maybe their alliance partner gets in the way and prevents them from being able to score additional points with the the rings that start out on the floor just because of the you know happenstance of, of the in-person events so that could actually cause their scores to go down uh, in an in-person event Yeah, so Rebecca, you're asking about the um, the guidance that we've provided in terms of expectations for in-person events. And our guidance has been, uh, early on, we were being, being very conservative as we feel like we're getting better and better about understanding how to uh, conduct events, um, you know, in-person school, um, we're, we're monitoring what other organizations are doing. We're seeing that you can have safe events in larger in, in environments. Um, and so we're expanding the number of what we originally projected, which was maybe just the drive team and the coach coaches associated with that to up to 10 people. And part of that it's driven by, um, we feel like we can, we can follow safe protocols that can keep everybody safe. We're looking at the space that we're able to offer in terms of how much, how many people can go into to those events, and and what the um, venues are saying is safe for, uh, you know, uh, social distancing in a pandemic, and then we're also looking at, um, you know, just trying to make sure, you know, the number of teams that are being allotted to each of these events. So very early on, we weren't sure if there were going to be if we were going to have to have events that had twenty or twenty-five teams at them. 
And if we had to do that, then we we're going to have to reduce the size of the teams or the number of people that participated so that we can maintain social distancing. But now that we've got a better grasp on how many teams are actually able to show up or, or are registered for each of the events, we feel confident or more comfortable about expanding that number out. We're also thinking that there's probably going to be some statistics of teams not actually hitting the full 10 members. Um, so we wanted a number that is going to be, you know, going to be a good number for 90, 95% of the teams. There might be a few teams that go over that number, but we're thinking that some of those teams, kids uh, or, or adults are just not going to attend because they don't want to participate in an in-person event. And that's totally okay. That there should be no pressure on anybody to attend that doesn't feel like it's safe or if they've got somebody that's a high risk that they live with or in close contact with and they want to do social distancing. I recommend that people make decisions about what's right for them with their families and not based on what we're doing or what, what the team is doing or anything else. It's, they really need to be focused on their family on that. So hopefully that's helpful. And I would say, yes, that's new info since we originally sent out details earlier in the season. Wouldn't you agree, Travis? Yeah, it's been an ever-evolving situation for sure. I mean, there was, there was a week there when I thought that, you know, there's like about a 5% chance we're going to have these live, right? So, uh, so the fact that things have been improving and stuff, it's, it's all been really positive. And yeah, we do. Yeah, it's been so hard on everybody and especially, you know, all the kids and especially kids who are like seniors this year. Um, you know, who missed out on a lot of stuff last year and, and, uh, you know, I've missed out on a lot of stuff this year too. Uh, hey, if we're moving in the right direction and we can do stuff safely, we want to give them the chance to do stuff uh, as long as we can do it safely and keep everybody, um, you know, as safe as possible. So. Yeah, to Stephen's question, he's asking if there were, if there's if it's possible for us to um, make an exception in terms of the number of participants for larger teams. Um, and this is something that you know one of the things that we did we we had actually a lengthy discussion about what the right number was. Um, and and to be quite honest with you guys, um, we knew that we probably weren't going to come up with the perfect number, we knew we were gonna get questions about it. But part of our goal tonight and part of this town hall is to get some feedback, right? Is, is do we pick the wrong number? Do you feel, does, is any team out there feel like we said 10 members are allowed from every team and now that changes your, your opinion of whether you would wanna participate in person or not? And it may be that you say, we don't wanna participate in person because we don't want that many people from every team. And we were thinking it was originally gonna be maybe five or six from each team, and now it's gone up quite a bit. And so that's a, that's created a new concern for you. Um, we need that feedback, but also, we, you know, Stephen, we need your feedback as well that, that you're trying to figure out how to get maybe 12 or 14 people at an event. And so uh, I don't, I, I'm, we're not gonna, we, we talked about this and, and we wanna stick hard and fast to our 10 number right now. But we also want to take the feedback from the community into consideration and see if there are other ways that we might possibly be able to accommodate, you know, whatever scenarios that, that come up from this. Okay, so um, I will take it offline. I don't think we're going to be able to give you an answer right now, Stephen, in terms of whether we can make an exception because we 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 know that exceptions then create bigger problems sometimes. So we want to make sure that that doesn't happen. Yeah, you know, it, I mean, it's unfortunate that we have to limit stuff, but, um, you know, likely, likely it's going to, 10 is going to stay the number, but we can continue to uh, have some discussion about it. Um, there, there are some things that we are considering as factors that may allow us to, to bump that number up a bit. And that is one of the factors is that we believe that there could be teams that don't, aren't, aren't actually going to be able to show up. Um, so if the number of teams gets reduced at an event, 
that would give us some room to uh, allow us to grow up the number. Because ultimately what it comes down to is we're trying to limit the total number of people inside the facility for an extended period of time. And so I think, you know, there's some, some areas that we would have some flexibility. And it's important that if, if you're a team that feels like for whatever reason, you're not going to be able to participate in an in-person event, let us know right away. And then that'll give us some room to, uh, you know, consider um, how we deal with, you know, maybe larger teams so that we can get, you know, allow everybody to participate. Again, it's all about the total number of people inside of these events, as opposed to, you know, trying to limit on a on a per team basis. We're just using the the number per team as as our uh, measuring stick right now, and the, the the way that we're setting up the rules. Yeah, we'll 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 evaluate, and we'll you know we'll uh, talk about what can happen here. Um, not sure if it'll change, but we do appreciate the feedback and, and discussion on it for sure. Uh, so, and I would say if you have any other stuff on that, you can email me directly or um you know send me something in discord and we can also uh talk about it that way so i see there's some good comments here about uh vouchers for athletic teams and stuff like that but uh so that's good okay um other questions and thoughts related to anything does everyone basically understand what we're doing here with uh with the judging and stuff I think that was a big one. Okay. Uh, see a thank you from uh, Rebecca and or, or Vance. You're, you're welcome. At, hey, it's it, this has been a very challenging year. <laughs> We do appreciate all the people who have, it's been a large number of people who have, uh, who have pitched in here. Um, and, uh, and, you know, the, the board has been fantastic. They are, you know, a big, big applause for that group of people. We've got about what, 10 people or so on, on the board and every one of them has been super uh, heavy duty contribution. And then there've been quite a few other volunteers who have, who have uh, helped make this thing uh, happen as well. So um, let's see. Oh, we got another question here. Yeah, Tom wants to know when the five minute video for the interview will be due. Uh, let, let's plan on that like two days before judging. Yeah, so, so all, all sure. the materials for the, the judged event will be, you know, if judging is on Saturday, all materials for that, uh, that Saturday judging will be due two days ahead of time. Yeah, and again, that's just to make sure that that we can access everything, you know, the judge, the judge advisors have time to check and make sure that if we can't access it on Thursday, you know, on Friday, we can still send you a message and say, Hey, check your permission, right? We don't want to be doing that on Saturday morning when the team is trying to interview yeah. is what it boils down to. So I think that's probably a, a plenty of lead time, uh, the two days in advance, uh, just for messaging. And, um, what are, yeah, what are the things, one of the things I will say that I'm really excited about, some interesting things that have come out of this particular season, but one of the really great things that I'm excited about is the work that Chris Silvano is doing as the, the state's judge advisor. Um, I don't think we've ever had a season where we've had consistency and built-in consistency across all of our events from a judging perspective. And I think that this is going to set up a, you know, set the foundation for even better seasons in the future. And I'm, I'm pretty excited about that. I think that the rest of the committee is excited about it. And Chris, we want to, want to thank you for taking on that role. We know it's a big role for you. Thanks. Yeah, that, that, that's big. Yes. So the, the, there is one other thing that it, it is notionally something that I want to do um, as well. Um, many of these things that are dictated by first, like the five minutes uninterrupted and the 10 minutes and stuff, but what I'm going to want to try and work with, I'll probably try and work with Ingrid or, or, or Travis or someone. I would also like to get feedback from the teams. The judges are providing feedback to the teams. I'd like to know the feedback of how 
if there's anything that we could improve in the judging process, obviously our hands are tied with many of the things that first has told us. So understand that, you know, five minutes of uninterrupted time is five minutes of uninterrupted time to be fair to all teams. That's not something that's going to be really flexible, negotiable, but you know, um, if during these initial judging events, if we start running into timing issues, if we start doing this, if we start doing that, uh, if the teams prefer a different format, if there, if there's any ideas, I'm going to try and see if I can submit a form, but you know, I'm on discord, you flow it to Chris Smith, Travis Smith, Ingrid, it, it will get to me and I will try and bring it back. Um, I appreciate the praise, but I think the the work is only beginning, and uh, there, it's not it's not going to be a one person show, and it hasn't been this entire season. So, yeah, I'll, I'll just uh, so add that, and we'll hopefully we can wrap it up here pretty quick. But um, you know, we thank everybody for bearing with us this year, as we have a completely new group of people running FTC. Right. I mean, some people have experience running specific events, but none of us have experience trying to run the state, uh, the, the state as a whole. And so uh, really appreciate all your patience with that. Our goal this season was more or less to survive and, uh, you know, let's maintain a, as good as we can and build, improve things where we can. But our goal is to try to make this really, really good over the next few years and every year to do things that make us better. And, you know, we have 70-ish uh, teams registered this year, which and probably 50-ish uh, that are playing, um, you know, just due to the circumstances. But, you know, hey, I'd love to see us have like 200 teams in like five years from now. I think that we can do that. You know, I think that's all. Those are things that are possible if we work together on this stuff. And uh, and so, you know, that but that takes all of us. That takes all the teams um, and getting it into different parts of the state who don't have it and stuff like that. So. Uh, and that includes the metro areas. The metro areas have shockingly few FTC teams. So um, even though you think that'd be the easiest place to have them, right? So thank you all. Uh, anything last last question, last second things from anybody? Yeah, Travis, I noticed a lot of teams are not competing this year. Is that due to COVID or do we expect that team number to jump back up? Looks like it's being recorded too. It is, yeah, Rodney. So <laughs> Oh, yeah, sorry. so um, I'm hoping that it mute. comes back. We had like 70 teams registered this year. I think we had about 80 last year. We had a bunch of new teams register this year. Not all of them are competing or have okay. competed so far. Uh, and then you've got – and then um, – we, we do know the that there are – there are some teams that have been unable to meet and compete yeah. because of well, – like, I'll say why not robots as an example, yeah. you know, from Ada, they've just, they were told that they just can't compete this year. This, the, you know, their, their organization is not going to pay their entry fee and they're not allowed to meet. So, wow. you know, that was just a thing that happened. It's, you know, that, and there's other teams that have been able, not able to compete or get together and build a robot for a number of reasons, most of them COVID related, but, okay. uh, and we hope to have those teams back. And so we want to, you know, but, um, in FTC, I'm glad we're, we've sort of, it's a lost season for a lot of those teams. Hopefully we can get them all back, but it's kind of up to all of us, I think, to next year, hey, let's, let's try to have some educational opportunities for coaches and, uh, and new team members and stuff early in the season where we can get people fired up or over the summer, you know, things like that. I think those are all things we can do um, that we can all help out with, so. And yeah. a handful of teams from last year that competed that are not competing this year. They they wanted to stop after last year because they graduated all their students and they had no one to refresh the team number. So, I mean, there's there's some instances like that as well. Yeah, there was a couple like that, yeah. Yeah, the, one of my biggest concerns for this year is that a lot of kids are really struggling with remote learning they're becoming more and more disconnected. And so I think some teams are really going to struggle to maybe come back next year just because of the, the disconnect. Um, it may, may be a, a, a much better year from a, 
a sign up perspective, it's kind of hard to say because people might be really excited about being able to get together and be able to do stuff and, and you know, get back to the way things were. But are we going to be ready by the time that school starts? And that's, that's kind of a question that's still outstanding. So we want to keep get these in-person events. This is one of the reasons why we're driving for in-person events, because we know that it helps build that, the community, it helps bring people together, it helps build that excitement, and then lets people know that we're really moving things forward for next year. Yeah. In fact, one of the things we talked about, if we were going to have to cancel a bunch of stuff here, would be you know, we have to do everything. If we had to do everything remote, you know, ideally, we would hope that things would be cleared up in the summer and then maybe you play uh, ultimate goal one more time before kickoff in the fall when you can bring all the new kids in and have them and have a, just a giant festival, a robot festival where we get everybody together and play. And maybe we do that anyway. I don't know. We'll have to see what the future brings, but, uh, but uh, it, it'd be great to play this one more time before everybody takes the robot apart and builds one for next year and, you know, and give new kids a chance to see what it's like. So. Yeah. And, and it's, this is one of those things that I think we're going to struggle with as um, how do we plan out the next year, next couple of years. And this is where an area where you guys can give great feedback is what do we need to do to, you know, build our existing teams and to bring in new teams and to, to grow our program. So everybody should be thinking about that. Um, your feedback is, you know, probably as, as valuable as anything. It's going to help us make our, make the state of Oklahoma the best it can possibly be with respect to FTC. And, and the outlets for that communication to flow are even, there's more of them and it's a wider spectrum than ever, yeah. even as some as formal emails or even casual discord, you know, there's been a lot of good stuff everywhere. All right. Uh, well, I, I mean, I think we have covered more than everything that we need to, but you know, our, our uh, lines of communication are always open. So if anybody has anything you, you forgot to ask about or didn't feel comfortable asking in front of the, the crowd here, uh, shoot me an email or drop, drop me or Christopher or Ingrid or uh, Chris or whoever a, a note in Discord or, or whatever, and uh, we'll be happy to help you out. So um, if that's, if that's everything we got, I think we are, we are done. I'm happy to hang out for a couple more minutes and, and chat, but, uh, but I think we can say the meeting is, is officially over, right? Yeah. Just so you guys know, I, I did record this. Um, I meant to announce that I was going to record it early on, but I forgot. So I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording now, Travis.